This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and is not to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. Patients in need of medical advice should consult their personal health care provider. From UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, welcome to That's Pediatrics. I'm one of your hosts, John Williams, Director of Pediatric Infectious Diseases and Director of the Institute for Infection, Inflammation, and Immunity in Children, or I4Kids. And I'm Steph Dewar, Vice Chair of Clinical Affairs, Residency Program Director, and a member of the Pediatric Hospital Medicine Division. We're happy to welcome Dr. Allison Larkin here today. She is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and is a member of the Allergy and Immunology Division here at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. She joined our department in 2011 after completing her fellowship training here and works clinically in the division and is also very active in education. Dr. Larkin, welcome to our broadcast. Thanks for having me. Well, we're excited to see you here today because we know there's some interesting clinical things that are happening in your division. Could you tell us a little bit about those initiatives? Sure. Um, one of the uh, things that I'm very involved with in, in our division and that I spend a lot of my time clinically um, doing is working with kids with severe asthma. Um, that uh, topic uh, involves caring for kids with asthma that's difficult to control but also refractory to, to treatment. And all of that being said, it's actually a really exciting time for this particular subject because there's um, many new treatment options that have come out that are steroid sparing drugs to use for for these kids. Do we have a lot of kids in this region, Dr. Larkin, who have uh, difficult to treat asthma? You know, this used to be a very polluted region, but with the loss of the steel industry, we're not so polluted. I wonder how much of a role that still plays. Yeah, so Asthma, as most of us as providers know, is a very common pediatric condition. Severe and difficult to treat asthma really makes up only about 5% of all of the kids with asthma. So many of us will see kids with asthma that's well controlled, meaning they're not in the ER, they're not in the hospital, they're on low doses of inhaled corticosteroids, we see them once or twice a year. They hardly ever flare. They're not utilizing emergency medical services, and um, and and they do okay. I happen to see a smaller percentage of kids who um, end up number-wise being less than everybody else, but service-wise require a lot of care and a lot of medications, some of which are not good to take chronically, like steroids all the time. So you you did mention that there are some new medications available because, uh, as you said, we all know that inhaled or systemic steroids is not uh, an optimal long-term approach. So tell, tell me a little bit about what those new therapies are. Yeah, so over the past 10 to 15 years or so, um, a class of drugs called biologics has emerged as treatment options for patients with difficult to treat asthma. So the one that came up first that's been around for 15 or so years is omalizumab or Zolaire, which is anti-IgE therapy. Initially, that got approved for kids age 12 and up, and then several years ago got approved for kids age age six and up. And then there's just been an explosion over the past five years or so of other biologic therapies that are targeting what we call TH2 driven pathways. So what most of us know as allergic pathways. And these therapies include uh, anti-IL-5 therapy. So there's two drugs for that. And anti-IL-4, IL-13 therapies. And there's lots of exciting things about each one of these drugs in particular, 
But there's also a lot to learn about these medications in that you guys might then say to me, well, now you've got four options for a particular group of kids who aren't responding well to their inhaled steroids and they're on oral steroids or in their, they're in the ICU, which one do you choose? And, and actually, that's kind of where we're learning uh, a lot now. So I, I know a little bit about Zolaire and, and that it's costly mm-hmm. and there needs to be pre-approvals and also the, the need, right? So hyper IgE, is it similar with these new medications? There's particular lab marking or what have you that we need to know about these patients before Yeah, we... exactly. So Zolaire is uh, weight-based dosed. It's, it's based on age and it's based on your IgE level. Um, when we block IL-5, we're looking for kids who have eosinophilic inflammation. So on a CBC, you're looking for usually around 300 absolute eosinophil count or more. So oftentimes when I'm seeing these kids who are difficult to treat, we're getting CBCs on them off steroids, right? Because the steroids will drop their EOs. So we're trying to get naive CBCs. Even the inhaled steroids. Usually the inhaled ones don't do it as much as the oral, but some of these kids are getting so frequent bursts that their hospital visit is during a burst, and then you're trying to get these biomarkers to decide what drug to use, and you miss a window because you get um, a low eosinophil count because they're on prednisone. Mm -hmm. It just happened the other day where I was in the ER seeing somebody that's been in the ER a bunch, and I I wanted to say, and I did say, pause, everybody, let's grab a CBC before we give you methylpred, (laughs) and um, that's going to help me decide what the right biologic is for you. But that's really amazing. I remember when the anti-IGE came out, but I didn't know about these anti-IL-5, anti-IL-4, and it's remarkable, one, because, you know, we have a lot of people here at UPMC Children's that do research in these areas, so to see that basic research in TH2 cells sort of make its way into the clinic is remarkable. It also reminds me, you know, TNF-alpha drugs have made a huge difference in things like juvenile idiopathic arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease, but they can have significant side effects from like blunting that immune response. Do these drugs have similar, you know, sort of immunosuppressive side effects that are risk factors? So in general, they don't seem to be immunosuppressants. The the concern though, and maybe as an infectious disease doc, you might find this interesting, is if the patient has a parasitic infection and we're blocking their eosinophilic um, pathway, there is concern, and this is on the package insert. Um, There's no clear recommendation on the package inserts to screen for parasitic disease. There have been updated global initiative for asthma guidelines, GINA guidelines, just came out recently in 2019 for difficult to treat asthma. And there's a small line in there that talks about consideration for looking for parasitic disease before you start kids on these drugs. I tend to screen with uh, antibodies before I do it. I've had one <laughs> come up um, detectable where um, we, we, we treated with um, antiparasitic drugs prior to starting the child on the biologic therapy. But from an infectious standpoint, um, it's n- it doesn't seem to be the same as the TNF blockade. Um, so really the counseling involves allergic reaction to the drugs, EpiPens with the drugs. And that being said though, several of them now are able to be given at home, which people love, right? So now you're able to use a steroid sparing therapy and you don't even have to come to the hospital to do it. So you go to work, you go to school, you do what you need to do and you don't come into the ER and you're not on steroids. That would be ideal for a difficult to treat asthma patient. So I'm assuming that you get your patients from uh, those folks that we meet in the hospital, like with my division, PCPs in the community, and then also your pulmonary colleagues that are maybe having these patients follow with them and recognize that maybe they would benefit from your therapies? Yeah, thanks for thanks for bringing that up. So I 
work in a clinic jointly with one of our pediatric pulmonologists, Dr. Eric Forno, and our referrals mostly do come from the pulmonary group um, where kids have been in the PICU, they've been intubated, they keep coming into the ER, or they come from my colleagues. And Eric and I see them uh, together and alternating and fairly frequently, um, sometimes every one to two weeks for a little while to try to get them under better control. Um, we are excited about the services that we offer and hope to be able to really expand these uh, to, to have kids coming in from um, pediatric, uh, general pediatric clinics as well, so we can help with that. Um, and, and we look forward to growing our clinic to be able to do that. Well, I just want to take a little moment to put a plug in for routine flu vaccines. I mean, certainly in this group of patients, that it would, it would be very difficult for them if they contracted influenza. And certainly we can all do our part to encourage all of our patients, families, colleagues, um, staff, what have you, to be up to date on our flu vaccine. That's, no, that's so, I'm so glad you said that too, and that's exciting for me to hear. We ask that at every visit. We provide these vaccines, and egg allergy is not a contraindication to getting these vaccines, so I'm happy to have um, the chance to, to say that too. Um, yeah, no, I think as an infectious disease doctor, you know, um, in my career, I've seen many, many kids who suffered and even died of influenza. Mm -hmm. Most of those kids were not vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Kids with, you know, asthma and, and difficult to treat asthma in particular, that's a very high risk group. And so not only should they get the flu vaccine uh, every year, uh, and in fact, it's not too late this year if people haven't yet gotten it, there's still plenty of flu season left. This is also a group that pediatricians and ER docs and those of us in the hospital should treat. If they do develop influenza and they're seen within 48 hours, this is a group of kids that we should be treating with antivirals. I'm also making <clears throat> sure that these kids have had their pneumococcal vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, so anything we can do to prevent disease, infectious disease in these kids is, is essential because as all of us know, they flare pretty easily, most of them with viral infections. I'm wondering if we could change gears a little bit and talk about food allergens and what's new in those testing and, and therapies. Yeah, so just like biologics are kind of exploding in our field, um, offering new and exciting treatments that are steroid sparing for asthma, we're all about to see the first FDA approved uh, food allergy treatment coming out. Um, the FDA had an advisory committee meeting in the fall to look at an oral immunotherapy product for peanut. The name is Papborzia. Um, this is um, going to be a huge part of advancement in our field um, and is incredibly exciting for families of kids with food allergies who have always been told to just avoid the food. <laughs> um, what, what we think, um, so, so it's not FDA approved yet, but I think in the next few months we are going to see it. And I actually think we're also going to see there, uh, another product approved, uh, a desensitization product in the version of a patch. So the one that I think we'll see first is the oral, and then I think we'll see a patch. The concept is you do small exposures over a period of time, getting to what's called a target dose or a maintenance dose such that the child who may have an accidental exposure out at school or on a play date or at somebody else's house would potentially not have an anaphylactic reaction to peanut. So it's not a cure, um, but it's creating a, a different level of tolerance. That sounds like allergy shots without the shots. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and, and so, which everybody would love that, especially the kids. And so the idea is that this would be, you know, by kids who have previous severe allergic reaction to peanuts, then they would take this to try and lessen their chance of having another severe. That would be huge because those of us, you know, we all know people uh, whose kids have severe peanut allergies and they live 
in fear and terror. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the rest of the world whose kids may not have peanut allergies are used to dealing with in daycare or in school or whatever, like, you know, peanut-free zones and these kinds of things. Well, it's interesting. I was actually on a flight recently, and an announcement was made that there was someone on that airplane with severe peanut allergy, and if anyone had a packet of any types of nuts to not open those during that flight. I had never experienced that. I, I thought that was quite remarkable, and to be that person, somewhat frightening to be in that small space with a whole number of us that could have exposed them. And what are they doing on the airline? They hand out bags of peanuts, right? So yeah. We got pretzels that day. Yeah, yeah. So it's nice that they're accommodating. It's, it's great that the families are aware, but I think you bring up a great point that this is a very anxiety-producing issue. We're seeing actually more so we're seeing more and more right so the prevalence is is increasing and we see more anxiety related to it from both the patient perspective and the family perspective so we've tried to integrate behavioral health into our clinics where kids that get very nervous and have anxiety related to eating and eating out um, can talk about it and get some help what about the new information uh, about earlier exposure results in less allergic responses? So the, the data for that particular subject is really best supported for peanut. And um, that what we know is that in infants, so kids under age 12 months with egg allergy and or moderate to severe eczema, should be considered for early introduction of peanut. So we end up seeing these kids. We will do scratch testing to peanut if they're nine months old and have had hives to egg, for example. If the scratch test is a certain size or less, we'll bring the kids in and feed them peanut. So you can feed it, we feed babies peanuts in the form of bomba usually so this looks like a cheese puff curl but it's peanut coated you can mash it up it's dissolvable and you can mix it with formula or breast milk and we'll feed babies this to see if they're allergic or not and if they're not we encourage the families of the egg allergic moderate to severe eczema kids to keep this in the diet a couple times a week mm. as you're saying to try to prevent it and Bomba is a crunchy, delicious treat. <laughs> they have a similar snack in Germany called Flips. Uh -huh. uh, so, so could we spend a minute on that? Why is this increasing in recent years? I know with, with some allergies, with environmental allergies, it's thought to be the hygiene hypothesis mm -hmm. that kids aren't exposed to as much you know, dirt and as many germs. Is that true for food allergies? Yeah, so I, I don't know that anybody entirely knows, but most of us think there's some combination of genes and environment that come together to predispose kids to this. Um, that being said, no one knows why there's more and more of it. And a lot of the questions I get in clinic are related to things like, um, 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 antimicrobial therapy, microbiome, um, um, what mom's eating, breastfeeding, and and I, I wish I had really great evidence-based medicine answers for all of these things, um, but we're learning more and more all the time. So can we um, talk a little bit about your path, not just into medicine, but into allergy and immunology specifically? What, what led you to where you find yourself today in your career? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. That's always fun to think about. John and I had a chance to kind of chat about this at a medical student dinner the other night. Um, so allergy and immunology gave me the chance to do a lot of primary care medicine, so long-term relationships with folks, seeing patients over and over again, and the difficult-to-treat asthma clinic really gives me that because I get to see them sometimes uh, every other week. Um, <laughs> But I also get to do inpatient consults where I'm seeing kids with um, unusual infections, thinking about why they got them. And, um, you know, another, we talked about biologics and we talked about um, immunotherapy for food. Um, 
We also, over the past few years, have started skid screening for severe combined immunodeficiency. So my field has seen really exciting advances in the past couple of years. So uh, so sometimes I could be seeing uh, allergic rhinitis in clinic and then five hours later um, meet a neonate with pneumonia who has no lymphocytes. So one of the things I love about my job is that I get to do all of these things. Um, I, um, I also get to work with multiple subspecialists, all of whom I, I have an interest in their own topic. So infectious disease, rheumatology, pulmonology, uh, dermatology, um, GI. I, I get to talk to a lot of really smart, great folks often about subjects that cross over. At our medical student dinner the other day, you know, my, my field is allergy and immunology. I think we're all immunologists. I mean, my, my field crosses over to everybody, so I get to talk to everybody. So that's another great part of what I get to do. Well, we are so delighted that you came to talk to us today and share your work in the difficult to treat asthma clinic uh, and what's new on the horizon in both asthma and food allergies. Once again, I thank you for coming and just to remind all of our listeners, get your flu vaccine and encourage others to do so. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. You can find other episodes of That's Pediatrics on iTunes, Google Play Music, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to keep up with new content. Leave us a review and tell us what other topics you'd like our experts to cover. Thanks for listening.